Um, well, first things first, I'd just like to say congratulations for Son of Saul. I don't want to sound like a kiss-ass, but I absolutely love the movie. Uh, thank you. It's, I thought it was one of the most visceral, lucid and immersive film experiences I've seen in quite a long time. Well, so you must be really proud of it. I don't know about that. I only <laughs> see the, you know, the mistakes I made. Um, but f for, for those who haven't seen the film or don't, might not know that much about it, can you give a, a really brief overview about what it's about? It's about... Uh, it's one day in the, in the crematorium of Auschwitz in 1944. Uh, it's the story of one man who is supposed to burn the bodies at the crematorium, the bodies that have been gassed. Uh, and he finds the body of one boy and he thinks that uh, this boy is his son and he tries to bury the son. And uh, while doing so, he turns away from the others in the, in, the, in the group, the commando, trying to rebel. So that's the story of this day. Okay. And mass. For, your, for your first feature film, what made you decide to tackle such a difficult and sensitive subject matter as the Holocaust? Didn't fancy starting off with a rom-com or anything? I wanted to talk about it, I just didn't know how, and uh, it took me years to figure out how I, I would do it. Uh, obviously, I didn't want to do the historical, usual historical film, uh, you know, with this, with the same, you know, with same approach. I wanted to find something different because I, I thought that what we're losing with these films is the, the individual experience, the inside you, as opposed to, you know, telling a story from the outside, a sort of remote pers perspective. And, and stories, you know, jumping from one character to, to, to another. I would really wanted to focus on one human being because being on, you know, making this portrait of one human being, we would um, uh, concentrate on the, on the human experience and, and, and you know, uh, by, by restricting the point of view and restricting the, uh, the focus, you leave a lot of uh, uh, a lot of space out of the frame, and you actually use the imagination of the viewer to convey something, a sort of intuition of what's going on around, and and the craziness, and the frenzy of the camp. So I guess it's uh, it's also sort of an immersive experience that was uh, that that was lacking, I guess, when thinking about you know, what the concentration camp was. Um, that was actually one, one of the first things that struck me in the film was, was the sound. Mm -hmm. uh, from the offset, it's like a cacophony of sounds coming mm -hmm. at you thick and fast, yeah, yeah. every angle, setting yeah. your imagination alight and wreaking yeah. havoc with your senses. What was your thought process behind getting the sound right? Did it take a long time? Was it, was it a big challenge? Yeah, the sound is... It was, a, it was a long, long process. I went to see the sound designer before the film. I told him it's going to be a film with 50% of sound. It's not just going to be a descriptive sound, you know, illustrating what you already see. It's going to be much more complex. And he was laughing. But he, we, we had five months of post-production in sound, and then he wasn't laughing at all at the end, I can tell you. Uh, but he, he kept focus. The, the image is uh, very restrictive, so we leave a lot of, you know, possibilities for, uh, for the viewer to imagine what, what's going on. And the sound is actually there to, uh, to suggest that there is much more than only what you can see. And uh, so it's, it gives you different levels and layers of, uh, and, uh, within the immersive experience. And it wasn't just the, the sound, I think it, the, the overall technical accomplishment of the movie was, was really, really impressive, from the cinematography to the, the long tracking shots and the shifting of focus. Um, how did you um, ensure all the moving parts came together to make such a film at the end? Oh, well, there's only one recipe that me, that's um, having the right people on board. Uh, it was very important to, uh, and that's what I did during my short films, trying to find the people I wanted to work with, the production designer, um, the, uh, the cinematographer, the, uh, the sound designer, 
uh, even you know the focus puller for this film is it's important. Uh, so um, how how to, how to achieve that is that you have to uh, you have to find the right people and also you have to think of your film as a sort of collaboration and and not only people who say yes to what you want is people asking questions and making your life difficult. Okay. So making my life difficult was was part of the game. Part of the challenge, part yeah. of the fun. Yeah. Um, speaking of the right people, casting for the lead role of Saw must have been very, 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 very important. Um, so Gizu Rurik, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, my wife's good. Hungarian, so I've had a bit of training. Yeah, it's um, that must have been an incredibly difficult decision because basically the entire movie, the camera's focused on him, inches from his face. Uh, he's in nearly every single scene of the movie, yeah. but yet he doesn't say that much in terms of dialogue. Yeah. What kind of characteristics were you looking for when you were casting for Saul? I was looking for someone who already is my main character in life, in a sense. He yeah, already has this, um, you know, stubbornness or obsessive way of being. Uh, he is. He's like that. Uh, he's very. Uh, he's, he has def different layers. He's very physical and very uh, uh, intellectual at the same time. Or. or he can be very spiritual, but uh, he can go from one, you know, within him there are there are forces that are uh, that coexist in a very 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 interesting manner. So I wanted to 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 have a, a real man, you know, a real a real person, um, and a real human being for this role. And I knew him from before, and uh, it just. You know, in the process of casting, we wanted to cast a established actor, but 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 it just didn't make sense when we knew we knew already what kind of approach we would have, and and it required uh, someone who is uh, who is believable as a as 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 an ordinary human being, but at the same time has a sort of other level, which is uh, you know unsuspected forces within him. Okay. I thought he was brilliant, by the way, and so much of the film was with his reactions as well. Yeah. But, um, I was just wondering who your inspirations were within filmmaking and what made you want to become a filmmaker? Uh, I had a lot of, lots of inspirations, but, um, you know, I really liked uh, Antonioni's and uh, Kubrick's films. I think these films were made the you know, strongest impression on me. For this film, we uh, we saw a film again and again called Come and See. It's a Russian film for uh, from the 80s. It's a very uncompromising, very strong film uh, on the Eastern Front in 19 in the 19 early 1940s. It's a uh, it's very powerful, very organic film, and uh, and we it was our reference. Well. Okay, and finally, what's next for Lazo Nemesh? Do you have any plans to direct any an English language feature film? Well, I have plans, but I don't want to rush, so uh, I'm taking my time. I have an, my next film lined up for um, uh, to to be shot in Budapest. It's an it's a 1910 Budapest film, a story of a young woman, in a thriller, coming of age film. So, um, so it's going to be uh, also a sort of uh, challenge how to make a, not the usual historical drama. Well, I look forward to it. Well, thank you very much, Laszlo. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!